So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this uh, COVID-19 journey at the University of Arizona. Uh, we're all very excited about your decision to join the ambassador program and the training you're about to undertake. Um, throughout the summer, President Robbins has said that the key to stopping the spread of COVID-19 at the U of A is through the engagement of students, faculty, and staff, and all of us together are adhering to public health best practices so we don't fall short like other universities have uh, been forced to, to close shortly after reopening. He and other leaders at the U of A within the and within the community are especially excited and impressed with engaging students to serve as leaders at each of the colleges to help your peers returning to campus to adjust to this new environment. Um, they will have, your peers will have many questions, uh, but you as leaders and as their peers, you will be very key and influential in responding to these questions, especially about the U of A test trace and treat plan. Before I pass the baton on to Emily Waldron, I'd like to give you a preview of the modules that were developed this summer by a group of our faculty at the College of Public Health. These modules go beyond just explaining what COVID-19 is, its epidemiology, transmission, and infection control practices, but it also gives you some context and background in the politics and economics of pandemics. This curriculum will be used by newly hired contact tracers throughout the state. Um, it's also being used with our SAFER program, uh, which is the, the University of Arizona at the College of Public Health. We have a student group that does contact tracing and has been doing contact tracing since the pandemics, um, since the pandemic here in, in Arizona. And we're also hoping to scale it up to the national level if and when we receive a CDC grant that we apply to, to do this and, in, and hopefully in multiple languages to address the needs of the immigrant and refugee population. So I'm going, I'm going to go really briefly and show you, but I'm going to stop my video so that I can share a screen with you. So these modules are located in the Western Region Public Health Training Center, which is housed within the University College of Public Health. And what you'll do is go into this page. You all have to sign up. You have to create an account. You go in there and you log on. And this page on contact tracing is under, under communicable diseases within the page at the Western Training Center. And these are the trainings that you're all going to be asked to go through. And you have to, unfortunately, you have to go through all of them. And you'll see that it's grouped in threes. So you have, and in some cases, two. So for example, you have being a contact tracer. It's got an introduction, the epidemiology, communi communicable, I mean, communication skills, how to establish rapport and, and communicate with people when you're doing the contact tracing. You may be asking yourself, why do I need to go through that? Well, we're gonna be doing, we are doing, and we have all summer, contact tracing on campus. And so it's important for you to know what that's about so that you can explain it to your peers. Then under, contact, under the contact tracing system, there's a module on incident command systems and the MEDSYS surveillance system. Again, you'll ask, why do I need to know that? Well, that's the framework. The incident command system is being used at the university. Uh, it's the framework that's being used to be able to, to, for us to have been able to plan and respond and mitigate um, situations at the university right? and on campus especially. So that's important to know. And also incident command systems are used at the federal, state and local level. So all the local health departments use this framework. The other is community import, the community importance of contact tracing. This is where you, you will learn about the economics and politics of pandemics. And these are really important, especially during this very politicized environment that we're in. And then you'll get a completion of a certificate of completion at the end. You have to score 80% on each of the modules before you can advance, uh, which I don't think will be a problem for anybody because you're all very bright and intelligent. Um, and so this is what you would get at the end. And I, I don't think 
Matthew Condi would mind if I shared his certificate. He's already gone through the program. This is, this is a certificate that you receive at the end. And then I'll stop sharing. And I failed to mention my name. I'm Cecilia Rosales. Um, I'm the Interim Associate Dean for Community Engagement and Outreach at the University College of Public Health, but also a professor and chair of the Department of Public Health Practice and Translational Research here in Phoenix. So I'm actually in Phoenix. And I'll pass it on to Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining today. I mean, I see 86 people on this Zoom, Zoom call. So that's really exciting. So welcome. Welcome, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen now. So I'm going um, I'm going to get it ready. And hopefully you all will be able to see it. All right. Can you all see this? Yes. Dr. Rosales, since I know she's unmuted. <laughs> um, so um, thank you all again for being here today. So I'm Emily Waldron. I'm the Community Engagement and Outreach Coordinator with the Melanie Eden Zeckerman College of Public Health. And I'm going to give um, all of you a brief overview um, of the plan for the re-entry at the U Arizona. And I'm going to turn off my video just because it's been an issue sometimes when I have my video and my screen on at the same time. So one moment. Okay, so you all should be able to still hear me. Um, so um, as President Robbins has said throughout the summer, um, you know, the key to stopping the spread of COVID-19 at U Arizona is all of us doing our part. And um, today I'm gonna give a brief uh, overview of this re-entry plan. And this will lay the groundwork to better understand the role student ambassadors play to keep our campus safe. So in this PowerPoint, there's actually gonna, there's some links to some really um, great slides, but, um, or really great resources. So we're gonna make sure this PowerPoint is available for all of you so they are able to access these links um, at a later date. So at the end of the presentation today, um, we're gonna hear from a couple, couple other people who will introduce, but we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answer. So please write your answer, your questions in the chat, um, and we'll, we'll um, I'll be able to facilitate that when it is, when it is time. Um, so I am going to start off with the first slide. So, um, the success of the Arizona reentry depends on all of us doing our part. There are four simple steps every student should follow as they return to campus this fall. Many of you have heard of these before, but I'll go over some of these steps in more detail in the PowerPoint. So um, students especially here today, please make sure your peers are aware of these steps. First one, number one, get tested. Number two, mask up. Number three, Download the COVID Watch Arizona app. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Number four, join Wildcat Well Check. Um, this website, the covid.arizona.edu, is a great resource and has all of these, um, all of this information listed out um, for more information. So there are some basic prevention measures that we should all make sure we are communicating to our peers and colleagues. The first, maintain physical distance of six feet. Wear face coverings that are required inside buildings and when physical distancing of six feet is not possible. Make sure people stay home if they're sick or if they have symptoms. And you know how I mentioned a couple minutes ago about some awesome resources. Here are three different videos that kind of go through um, things that we all can do on campus to make sure that we're all doing our part. So feel free to check those out at a later time. So you've probably all heard of the three T strategies to stop the spread of COVID-19 at the University of Arizona. Students, faculty, and staff will probably get questions about this throughout the semester. And it is important to have an understanding of what this looks like. A lot of you are student leaders on the call, so I imagine you'll get some questions and you may already be getting some. So the first step of the three T's is test. Identify who was infected. Up to 40% of people who have an active infection show no symptoms and can spread the virus. The second step is trace. So alert people who may have been exposed to the individual who tested positive so they can self-quarantine, get tested, and stop the spread. And finally, the third step is treat. 
isolate and treat people who test positive for COVID-19 so they don't spread the virus to others. And again, you can find out more information about the three T's. And um, I have to say, Dr. Rosales um, played a huge role in this. So she's a great resource. So for questions and answers, I'm sure she's gonna be able to, to answer uh, questions if you have any. Um, but this, this website is a great, a great resource um, to the University of Arizona. So let's talk about testing. Testing identifies those who have an active viral infection and clears those who don't have the virus so that we can all stay safe. So there are three types of tests, the antigen test for active virus, the PCR test also for active virus, and the antibody test for previous exposure to the virus. Again, another link, but this is some great information on um, those tests and how they're used. And I do wanna show this, this um, this infographic that was actually developed by one of our interns here with the College of Public Health, uh, Christina Gomez Padilla. Um, she developed this on three types of three types of testing. Um, this is a really great resource and I'll send this out as well um, with the slide deck. So for all of you on the call today, I imagine you might get the question from someone, your friends, colleagues, what do I do if I test positive? Well, first, the infected person, the infected person um, needs to isolate. So he, he or she does not spread the virus. The university will provide students with support when they are in isolation. Also, the sec secondly, the infected person needs to self-report. This is really important that they do this as soon as possible through this website on the slide. Time is critical. The quicker the report, the quicker a team of contact tracers can start following up with their contacts to let them know that they have been exposed and steps um, can be taken to stop the spread of COVID-19. So make sure people in your college and your organizations know to answer the phone when the U Arizona contact tracing team calls. moment. I'm just having an issue with my computer here. Um, so let's talk about trace. So this is the second step. The, the, the idea behind the trace component of the three key strategies is to track down trace and alert anyone who might have been exposed to a contact, which is a person who tested positive for the virus. There are three parts of the trace component. So this gets a little bit heavy. So um, again, these resources provide a great, a great deal of um, information. But the traditional contact tracing. So this is actually something that has been do that we've been doing with the Zuckerman College of Public Health, our students for a long time. It's a proven public health team powered by students and staff volunteers who call people who test positive to ask for any people they have been in contact with. Then the contact tracer calls those people, lets them know they have been exposed and tells them to isolate for a certain number of time. So the big thing about this is it relies on self-reporting and cooperation. So making sure that as students and staff and faculty, um, students and other folks who test positive understand that telling um, contact tracers who you have actually been in physical contact with is very important. Um, it's important to be honest so we can stop the spread of COVID-19 at U Arizona. And then there's a COVID Watch Arizona exposure, no exposure notification app. This is a fully anonymous app. Um, it's a Bluetooth app actually, which will alert you if you have been exposed. Everyone, so everyone on campus right now needs to download this if you haven't already. Um, and make sure you tell your friends and colleagues to do the same. So basically how it works, if someone was close to the phone within a risky date and time range, they'll receive an exposure notification alert. And this is a really good way um, to make sure people know as soon as possible they have been exposed to COVID. Finally, we have the Wildcat Well Check. And this is a texting-based health reporting system. Again, the link is there. Um, employees and students can sign up for text or email notifications. And after enrolling, the Wildcat Well Check sends a brief daily health screening via text messages, net text message or email. So these are three really important things to keep in mind. You're probably gonna get questions about this, um, but hopefully this gives you a little bit more background so you can answer those questions as they come up. Okay, the final step of the three T's is treat. So campus health actually leads the treat component of the three T strategies. 
Those who test positive for COVID-19 will be treated with wraparound support, and those people should stay home and isolate to stop the spread. Making sure that we're communicating that to our campus colleagues is so important. And they should also self-report to Campus Health and the U Arizona contact tracing team. Um, campus Health will provide guidance, answers, and healthcare support. Again, another link to some great information, so I encourage all of you to check that out. Okay, so let's do a little review here. So there's these three T's. We can all do our part to stop the spread. Get tested, mask up, download COVID Watch Arizona, and join Wildcat World Check. Those are the four steps that we should all be taking on campus to stop the spread of COVID-19. Again, another website, 3 T's website, check it out. It goes into more detail about the 3 T strategy. So we've covered um, a lot of information today in a, in a really short amount of time. And, um, and Dr. Rizal had shared earlier that there are modules available through the Western Regional Public Health Training Center, which goes into more detail on how these imp um, important public health practices will help us beat COVID-19 at the University of Arizona. So just to let you all know, if you haven't heard of, um, I know Dr. Rizal has talked about it, but just as kind of a reminder, the Western Regional Public Health Training Center is one of 10 regional public health training center centers that were funded by um, the Health Resources and Service Administration to support the public health workforce. So the trainings will be hosted here on the Public Health Training Center website, which Dr. Rizal has shared. Um, anybody from your college can have access or college, or I know I recognize many people on this call today who are not necessarily from colleges, from sororities or fraternities or other organizations, welcome. Um, but they just need to sign up through the Western Regional Training Center. So I'm gonna show a quick video that we put together um, about the um, about the um, about the train. So just give me a second as I navigate my screen here. So I'm going to stop sharing this, and I'm going to share another screen. So. Nope, hang on. One moment. <laughs> all right. Can you all see this video? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start here and let's see. And if you can just give me Dr. Rosales a thumbs up if you can hear the sound. So I'll get started. This video is a tutorial on how to register and access the Zuckerman College of Public Health contact tracing program. Begin by opening a web browser and navigating to moodle.publichealth.arizona.edu. If you already have an account, you can log in at this point, or you will be asked to log in before you are able to enroll in a course. Click on View Courses underneath the Western Region Public Health Training Center section. From here, you can search for a course or you can find it in the communicable disease category. If you have received a direct link to the course, this is the page you are likely to see. We will now need to log in in order to enroll. If you do not have an account, you can create one. Now that we are logged in, we are able to enroll in the course. Click Enroll Me. We are now enrolled in the contact tracing program. This program consists of seven modules that must be completed in order. Each module has a quiz at the end that you must pass with 80% or higher to advance to the next module. Clicking on the module opens the goal and objectives for each lesson. Click enter to launch the lesson activity. The lesson will open in a new window, so be sure to enable pop-ups on your computer browser. When you have completed the modules, you will be issued a certificate of completion. We thank you for your continued service and your commitment to fight COVID-19. Happy learning. Okay. This video is a tutorial on how to register and access the Zuckerman College of Public. Sorry about that. You can all see that I listen to classical music when I'm, um, when I'm working that came up on the end of my screen. Um, 
So this is a great resource. So I'm going to kind of transition us. Um, one of the one of the things that um, with these modules, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of an overview of a module that I actually created on the student ambassador training. And I'm actually going to be joined by two students who are going to help me with that. And I'll be introducing them in just a moment. But first, I'm going to share with you all um, the actual training. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this uh, share screen again. So just give me one moment. Always a little nerve wracking trying to trying to share a screen with 88 people, 88 people on the call. One moment. All right. Can you all see that? I'm gonna ask Dr. Results to give me a thumbs up if she can see it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this is an example of one of the um, trainings um, in terms of the format. Um, major shout out to the students who helped us put together these trainings. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this student ambassador um, module and uh, how this works. So like I said, let's talk first about the goals and objectives. So at the end of this module, so one of the things the module is going to focus on is um, describing the purpose of a student ambassador module. Uh, participants will learn how to apply inclusive communication techniques to educate peers about COVID-19 prevention practices. They will understand strategies to utilize and share accurate information on social media with peers to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And they'll also learn how to illustrate the leadership role student ambassadors will fulfill within the U Arizona community to stop the spread of COVID-19. And just like the other modules, after a successful completion, participants will receive a certificate of completion. Um, so this training actually, so I'm going to go with my, with my uh, cursor. I hope you can see it, but you can see on the um, left hand side when you look at your screen, the different parts. Um, so I'll be speaking to the understanding of the student ambassador model uh, section, and then we have two students, Cody and McDell, who are public health students, um, who'll be introducing themselves, talking to us about um, the roles of student ambassadors. They're actually current student ambassadors right now with the College of Public Health. And then we'll be talking about the importance of professionalism and promoting understanding diversity. And we'll also share some of the activities that they, they do as student ambassadors. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. I can see all of you. And um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what is this ambassador model? I know we hear about, we've been hearing about this a lot this summer. So the concept of the ambassador model is that students actually partner with the university leadership um, to promote a healthy and inclusive environment through fostering relationships with fellow students. And the ambassador support structure varies throughout the colleges. Um, it can vary within, within clubs. Um, it's kind of based on whatever works best for your organization. The, we, there is a faculty or staff member who's there to advise students. Um, we, have, uh, we have someone who's gonna be talking a little bit about that, uh, Chris Tisch, who works with our students with the College of Public Health. And we know as we all adjust this new normal, student ambassadors and student leaders will naturally play a vital role in communicating public health safety measures to peers, educating campus health, um, educating on campus health services, and how people can access their personal provider for physical or emotional services. And we realize that a lot of these students on this call are already probably doing that. You know, during this first week, they were helping their, their students, um, fellow students. We're hoping that this, um, this presentation will provide just a little more context and a little more information. Um, but why, so why are we engaging students? Well, I mean, we kind of already mentioned it, but really students, students are with other students. I don't, I don't spend my day with students a lot. And so we should have students talking to students about how this campus looks. So the campus looks very different um, than March when everyone was here. And there'll be a lot of changes that are continuing to come as we all adjust this new normal. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Cody and Idell, um, who are graduate public health students who serve as student ambassadors with the Mellon Eden Zuckerman College of Public Health. Um, Cody and Idell will speak to their current role as an ambassador with the College of Public Health. So Cody McDowell, um, if you guys can introduce yourselves um, and, and start your, start your uh, conversation with the group. 
All right, hey everybody. Um, thanks, Emily and Dr. Rosales. Uh, my name is Cody Welty. I'm an MSPH PhD student in the College of Public Health. Um, Megda, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Emily and Dr. Rosales, for having us. I am Megda Habiba. I'm a doctoral student in epidemiology in the College of Public Health. And as, as we kind of go through this, we'll, we'll be bouncing back and forth between different topics and we'll try to keep it uh, more of more conversation style and a little bit more informal. We don't have a, a set PowerPoint for you. So it's a lot of uh, just going to be us kind of hopefully talking and discussing. So if you have any questions about anything that we bring up, please uh, feel free to include it in the, in the chat um, as we go through. Um, just kind of a brief overview. Um, the goal of our ambassador program is to really connect with current students and prospective students as well. Um, and that means like emailing, meeting with students and, and plenty of other activities and, and really answering questions and trying to be there for students as they come in and really representing the college. And even though Magdal and I are both PhD students, we have plenty of other graduate student ambassadors of, in MPH programs. And we also have undergrad student ambassadors as well. Um, and so really the again the goal is to like connect and, and kind of build trust um, with our peers and and other graduate students and undergraduate students within the college. Um, I do you want to talk a little bit about some of our communication and maybe uh, um, like resources and question answering? Sure um, so the ambassadors as Cody kind of alluded to are um, a network of students um, at all different um, levels of the college, um, the undergraduate and graduate levels, and in all the different programs um, that work with our um, advisor, Chris Tisch, um, who is in the student of student um, affairs, and we kind of work to um, figure out what um, the needs of current students are, um, and also work to answer questions of prospective students um, who are interested in attending the College of Public Health. Um, and so we are trained as ambassadors in um, kind of the application process, both from our own experience as uh, prior prospective students, if that makes sense, um, but also just in the ways um, that all the different programs um, apply to the college um, and all the different resources that are um, within the college. And so we're trained in those things, um, but then we work with um, faculty advisors within the college, um, mainly our program directors to make sure that we have all of the most recent information on the different degree programs. Um, and then we also work with Chris and the other staff um, in the Office of Student Affairs to um, have the most updated information about um, like timelines for application um, and when applications are due and all of those uh, logistical things that are important for students who are thinking about applying to the college. Um, and our goal is to be able to prevent, present um, prospective students with the most, um, the most information that we can to kind of inform their decision on um, attending the college and, and choosing to apply. Um, and then to make sure that they kind of have a solid understanding of the college when they um, do start classes um, every fall. And I think one of the, one of the most important parts of um, being an ambassador is your communication with um, prospective students and current students. And one way I like to think of it is the is a fairly common phrase, the, the no wrong door policy, where if a student emails you or reaches out, you we do our best to answer the question, even if we may not be the best person for that. For example, I'm a PhD student in health promotion sciences. Um, I've been reached out to by prospective MPH students in epidemiology. I'm probably not the best person to answer their questions, um, but I would be, uh, my role is to do the best I can and then refer to someone that might have answers uh, to questions that I don't. Um, and so it's not just a quick forward of an email. It's, hi, thanks for contacting. Um, here's my understanding, but here, let me, let me help get, get you in touch with the person that you need. Um, and really trying to be as, as positive as possible while you're communicating with people um, and really just representing the college in a good way. Um, McDowell, do you want to jump to um, a little bit on um, like some of the diversity within the college and like professionalism when we're, when we're interacting with people? Yeah, yeah. So the College of Public Health and um, I think the U of A in general 
is a very diverse environment. Um, so all the students come from very different backgrounds, um, varying knowledge of um, public health and how that looks in the community, um, different levels of knowledge about um, different research areas and whatnot. And so our goal as ambassadors um, is to respect that diversity and to understand um, that while everyone does come from different backgrounds, all of those backgrounds are important to our um, understanding of and um, application of public health um, practices, both as students, but also as practitioners of public health. And so um, that's one thing that we try to encourage in our discussion um, with students is that there is, um, I guess there is like elementary school teachers say like there's no wrong answers or like there's no wrong questions. Um, basically to say that while everyone does come from different um, backgrounds, that all of that is valuable. Um, and all of those, those perspectives are important for um, having a holistic understanding of our community um, within the college and um, in the larger Tucson community. Um, and so our, um, our role as student ambassadors is to provide um, as much education as we can on different public health topics um, and answer questions in a way that's honest and professional, um, but also respectful of diverse backgrounds um, that students may come from. Um, and understanding that it is our role to um, represent the college well, but also to um, be um, honest promoters of um, true public health um, practices. And so there are situations where we don't know what to say or how to handle different situations. And so that's where existing in a network of other students and faculty um, really comes in handy. Because if there's something that I don't have an answer to, um, there are other students to reach out to or other faculty as well um, that can kind of um, come in and save the day, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, uh, kind of like Magdal was saying, um, one, one challenge is that a lot of students that we interact with have different worldviews than we do or that many other people do on campus. Um, so, for example, with COVID-19, some students may have gotten sick themselves or known a loved one who was sick or, or died from COVID, where, whereas other students that contact us might not view COVID-19 as a serious issue. And it's important for us to, under, to do our best to understand uh, all of the perspectives while while still conveying accurate scientific information and referring to, to accurate websites and other other resources on campus as well. And what's another thing that's important for us is to not like sh necessarily like shame students for like well I, I don't really want to wear my mask it's it's hard to wear because we're in public health we know shaming doesn't really work it's not effective and so uh, we try our best to, to validate different perspectives and and provide as much support as we can, again, while conveying as much accurate information as, as possible. Um, another point on diversity, it's important within your, your own ambassador program to, to have your ambassadors actually look like your students and not, um, you, don't, you don't want just 10 white students as your ambassadors. It doesn't send a very inclusive message to, to any incoming students. And so that's one thing I think we do a very good job of within public health is the amount of diversity within program, within background. Um, and all of our ambassadors are, are fairly representative of our incoming students as well. We have students from everywhere. We have students with disability as ambassadors. And I think it's a really important way to, to really exemplify inclusion um, from the program level to the leadership level as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll touch really quickly on, on a couple of the activities and then Miguel, if you don't mind finishing those up. Sure. Um, one thing we do that can be a bit of a challenge is our social media web, our page for the college. So our ambassadors run the Mescaf social media page um, with some, or the Instagram along with the help of Shippard, a read who's on this call today. And one thing that can be challenging is that a lot of public health has now become politicized. And so it's hard to know what's acceptable to post and what's not. And so one of the guidelines that we've stuck with as a college is that does this message that we're promoting adhere to the mission of the College of Public Health? And our mission is to 
promote diversity, inclusion, and and address health, health equity as best we can. And so we try to make sure that all of our messaging sticks with that mission and goal. And even though it's a challenge, um, it's important to, to stick to that mission and, and support incoming students and current students as best we can through that. Um, yeah, so that is one of the main things that ambassadors um, do. Um, and so we also are, um, as part of our function as a resource for students, um, we work pretty hard to have updated resources for students um, and places where we can send people to get most accurate information. And so Campus Health is one um, pretty big resource for us right now um, in this um, current COVID situation um, that we are trying to utilize uh, to have students be aware of um, the most updated policies and practices and where to go if they need any type of support, whether that is um, physical or emotional. Um, and then we also work to engage faculty and staff in kind of our work as ambassadors and to be updated on, on the work that they're doing, um, but also to kind of have uh, a point of contact for students to go to for additional information on ways to get involved. Um, there are many students who are involved in um, various ways with the contact tracing effort um, in the college. And so they've done that by just reaching out to faculty members um, within the college. And so that's another way um, that we kind of serve students. Um, and then because the ambassadors are um, a network of people, um, we do meet um, bi-weekly and we email each other just to be most updated on, on what is happening um, in, the, in the college and um, with COVID in general. Um, and so that's typically what our activities look like um, as they relate to our current um, situation as a campus. Um, but there are two questions in the chat um, that Cody, I thought we could talk about really quickly. Um, the first is from David um, who asks, uh, what about people who do not believe in science or the contact tracing program or simply believe that COVID is a hoax and how um, can and should we approach them? Yeah, that's a, that's a really challenging question, David, and, and one that I don't think just sticks with, with public health. And I feel like the, e the easiest reaction and one that, that I've fallen victim to myself is to um, be really dismissive and, it, oh my gosh, how can they think something like that? But um, they're just as much of a victim of misinformation um, as, as anything else. So the best thing we can do, and a lot of this just comes down to, to communication and trying to understand as best we can, is to um, understand that that is their worldview right now. And it's not going to be possible to convince every person, but that doesn't mean you don't try. Um, and, and give your best effort to try to convince someone that um, them wearing a mask is protecting everybody else. And and even if it's a little bit inconvenient for them, and if they don't believe it works, it's really not that big of an ask to put a, to put a mask on just in case. Um, that's just one example. Um, maybe I'll do you have any other thoughts on that one, but, but really great question, David. And, and that's hard. It's, it's really, really hard. Yeah, it's hard as a scientist to hear someone say that your entire job doesn't exist. Um, but I think that, um, similar to what Cody said, I think just recognizing that um, there is a diversity of information as well as diversity of people. And so um, where we get our information from shapes the way that we view the world. And so with that, instead of taking it, I think as a personal slight um, to, to think of, of ways to make it real, I think to people where um, it's easy to say that it's not an issue if it's external to you and the people that you know. Um, but I think that also um, COVID is now at a point in the US where a lot of people um, know someone who's had COVID. And so putting them in the situation where they have to think about the people that they know and love um, as maybe potentially being exposed by someone who was not taking appropriate public health action um, can maybe make it a little bit more personal and a little bit more tangible, I think, to people so that it's not just this far away um, type of horror story almost, but is, is very real to us um, in the way that we understand it. 
Um, but yeah, I think that is that is really a challenging thing. Um, uh, and if if in y'all's experience you come across different ways to handle that, I think you should also let us know because <laughs> we're asking probably, a lot of the same questions. And probably publish a few papers as well. Uh, maybe yes. one a prize. So yes. those lines. Um, was was Monica's question the other one that uh, that I, think I, we I just run through second. This is a really good question. One of the reasons that we included uh, the module on the politics of pandemics and contact tracing. So you'll learn quite a bit about the politics behind all of this. And so you'll find this very interesting. And so thank you for that question because this is the reason why we put these modules together. Great. Monica had a great question as well, which was. Um, in, in some of their EPI courses, they've stressed how unreliable self-reporting data is, and do we feel like this is going to work in this situation, and if so, why? Again, really good question and completely fair, and I appreciate your, uh, your background within public health and, and using some of the learning from that as well. So there, I cannot speak to all of the reasoning why we are going with each strategy, but what I can tell you is that self-report data um, while it's not the most ideal, we can't like test every single human. Um, and we do have to rely on the things that are available to us. And self-report data, when it's um, incentivized to the person to report, in which case they're helping save lives and save um, um, their friends' lives and other things as well, it tends to be more accurate, especially when it's anonymous. Um, so something like the Bluetooth sharing, those are more anonymous as well. And, and those come with a little bit less, less risk of um, viable data. But Dr. Rosales, you obviously have a lot more background in, in science related uh, um, survey design and, and things like that um, as well. And Megdal, if you have anything else to add, um, feel free. I think you handled that one really well. Yeah. I agree. I think, um, yeah, self-report, self-reporting data, I think, is just like any other source of data is um, flawed, right, because we're humans who are collecting it. And so I think the the best thing that we can do um, with all of the, the data that are being collected within the contract, contact tracing team um, is to ensure that it's consistent um, and so that we know that the, those data are um, a little bit more reliable. Um, but because that's that's what we have to work with, then that's all <laughs> there is, unfortunately, um, to that. But I think that the more we can um, encourage people to participate with the contact tracers and to um, share their contacts so that they can be reached um, through through the appropriate steps, I think the, the better we the better chance we have of um, being able to make accurate, um, drawing accurate conclusions from our data. So contact tracers have to be really skilled, right? To be able to draw that information and, and mm -hmm. as accurate as possible. And of course you will get, you, know, you, you may get some bad information, but I think it's, there is a module in, in, the, in the curriculum that addresses those issues. So I'm gonna have- Oh, go ahead, Emily. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Cody. I know we have a bunch of questions coming in, and they're all great questions. So I wanted to ask um, Chris just to kind of um, give a brief uh, summary of kind of what she's doing with the College of Public Health, and then I was hoping we could go back and address all these questions. We still we still have about fifteen minutes. I'm going to let Chris just speak to speak briefly. I don't think we can hear you, Chris. Just a sec. Here you now. We can hear you. We heard you a while ago, Chris. Let me try to unmute you and then if it doesn't work, we'll go on to, we'll address the rest of the questions here. 
because I know there's some really great questions. That one question from Leah, by the way, while we wait for Chris, where it is asking, does everybody in, in the U of A Net ID have access to trainings with the Western Training Center? You have to go into the website and you have to register. And then it'll give you access to all of the trainings and any of the mm -hmm. trainings. Chris, I think we can hear you now. Oh, never mind. Okay, we'll continue on with the questions. Um, so we have some really, we have some really great questions. I'm gonna just kind of read these off. So we had a question about where we can download the app. Um, Google Play Store and Samsung Galaxy Store have many apps with similar names and the UA Arizona one doesn't come up. So I'm gonna let either Dr. Rosales or Shippard speak to this. I think Shepard placed the um, the website to download the app. I'll just jump in quickly. Unfortunately, there is um, there's a there's a bug with the Android version of the app where uh, it does it will not bring up the app if you type in separate word COVID separate word watch. It will only show you the app if you type in COVID watch. They are working hard to try and resolve that. Um, however, if you use the button link from the web page on your phone, it will take you directly to the app on the Google Play Store. Thank you, Shepard. Um, we got a question, what is the training called? And the training that we just did that I just kind of went through, um, is, this one's called the Student Ambassador Model, Crushing COVID-19 Through Peer Education. Um, and then we have a question here. Does the UA COVID webpage offer support for off-campus students if they are needing to self-isolate? So that's a question from Robin. So if you're so if you're an off-campus student, yes, off-campus students. Right. So they ask you. So the only thing you can do is is isolate at home. Of course, that may be difficult in certain situations. Um, but if you can, if, if you can isolate at home, that's the recommendation at this point. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rosales. Only the, only the on-campus students, students that are living on campus, there is an isolation dorm. So if you're found positive, if you were found positive when you were enrolling and waiting for your keys, if you all recall, if you're, if you're living on campus, you couldn't get the keys to your dorm until you tested negative. If you tested positive, you would be placed for about 10 to 14 days in an isolation dorm. And then you could return to your assigned dorm. And then during the, during the semester, if you, if you become positive, you will be placed in, a, in the isolation dorm as well. Thank you. This is Shippard. I would just add to that, that, you know, if, if, the situation arises where you need support that reaching out to campus health would be the best path. Right. Great. We have a very specific question um, that came up here um, from Robin with the libraries and she said earlier this week we had a student receive a notification of a possible exposure while studying in the library. The student did not need to inform us but they were being responsible and wanted us to know. This allowed us to call FM facilities management so they could clean the study room where the student had been for several hours that day. I assume if this was a positive case, the TRACE program would circle back to the library so that we could quickly clean the facility. That's in the form of a question because I'm looking for the question. Oh, I'm sorry. So it's, um, it is in the form of the, I think the question was, will the TRACE program circle back to the library um, to let them know if there was a positive case. Um, and Chipper, you help me with this as well, but it, they may or may not, uh, which, is, which is the reason that we ask that everybody voluntarily inform everybody about their exposure or their, their positive test. 
because the sooner people, the sooner the tracers know, the, the, the faster they can trace and do the contact investigation of everybody involved. Absolutely. So this is, a, this is another question that I think is really good. And it kind of goes into um, kind of what Cody and Magdell talked a little bit about. How can the college address the news coverage of people or persons getting coronavirus twice? That's a good so question. Shepherd. Yeah, Shepard, <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> um, so to the extent of our knowledge right now, there is one identified officially, scientifically identified case of somebody getting coronavirus twice. And that person um, did not become ill uh, because they already had antibodies in their system. Um, but they did get reinfected officially. There was active virus in their system. Uh, however, to the extent of our scientific knowledge and, and my reading and my conversations with our faculty, it, it seems very likely that most people who had been previously exposed to the virus would have antibodies and would have some degree of immunity. Um, However, the scientific data is not in on that. So we always use that, that uh, uh, caveat when we talk about it. Um, but the, it, it is, as, as most of you I think probably know, the University of Arizona also has an antibody testing initiative. And if you were to take that antibody test and test positive, um, you, you might not have known that you were exposed uh, if you have antibodies, because up to 40% of people who do have an infection are asymptomatic, which means they, they, they don't feel sick, they don't have symptoms, they don't realize they're sick, but they can still spread the virus. Um, and so there are a lot of people out there who don't realize that they were ever infected, um, but that could be discovered through the antibody test. And one of the studies that's being conducted through the College of Public Health right now is a study called AZ Heroes. And that study is actually trying to get the data to show exactly what percentage of the population uh, it, it experiences some immunity if they do test positive for antibodies and how long that immunity might last. Um, so we are actively trying to answer that, that very important question. Uh, but broadly speaking, it does not seem like uh, there are many cases of uh, scientifically proven reinfection. So I hope that answers the question. And just, just to add to that, Chipper, the antibody test that is a, a collaboration between the statewide antibody testing that's being done in the state of Arizona is a study. And it's also to, to, to answer those questions as well. The HERO study is for first responders and healthcare workers. And so participate in these, in these uh, programs because they are part of the University of Arizona studies that are being conducted by our own people because the antibody test was developed at the university by the immunologist. And so it's also trying to answer those questions. So please participate in those, in those studies. Well, we have, um, and I second that. I mean, it's really exciting what we have going on here at, at the University of Arizona. Um, we, have a, we have a question about um, self-isolating. Oh, thank you. We had um, an off-campus student employee report. They were self-isolating. And is there any additional information we could send to them? So what we can do, Emily, because we're running out of time, we can take all of those questions that we didn't respond to and respond to them and send them in writing. Perfect. To all of the, to everybody that's on the, uh, on the call. Perfect. And we will follow up. Um, we'll follow up with, with all of you with that. And then we'll also um, make sure you saw the link. Uh, Dr. Rizal and quite a few other people I saw post the link to the training. So that's, that's great to the Western Regional Public Health Training Center. Um, so at this point, I think we're at, so um, I think we're at a point where we have, we've told you all about the trainings, they're, um, they're available. Um, and so I think with all the colleges kind of going forth, 
and with your student leaders, um, getting them trained. Like we said before, they're, they're self-paced. They have the, the, they'll get a certificate of completion. Um, and we're, we're really excited to have such a great turnout today. Uh, Dr. Rosales, um, I'm going to turn it over to you for any, any final words. Right. So at this point, I think it will be up to your individual colleges to sort of convene you, to orient you to, to, to the college, to your college and to your faculty and staff and uh, students and identify you or present or recognize you as, as, their, as the college uh, ambassadors. We are hoping with Shippard's help that we can put together a, uh, maybe a, an article, Shippard, with maybe, I don't know how we would take a group, we can't take a group picture, but we can certainly take a picture of the screen right now and maybe sort of introduce to the university the new ambassadors that will be working on this initiative uh, along with the leadership, faculty, and staff of the University of Arizona. Um, but at this point, I think the important, it's important to have each of your individual colleges um, introduce you to, their, to, to students, faculty, and staff. And we're here as a College of Public Health to answer any of your questions, uh, provide um, any additional training that might, you know, might arise that you may think is needed. Uh, but for now, we're, we're gonna be sending you the link to the ambassador module and uh, the other modules that we presented to you earlier in the, in the program. And as soon as you complete that, you can, you can make that certificate available to whomever is designated. We, we were, you know, before this, before, during the planning of this, um, of this session, we kept referring to um, the counterparts to Chris Tisch, who's the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs, as the Chris's of the <laughs> other colleges. Um, so I think if you, once you complete that uh, training, just send those certificates and let everybody know within your college that you've been, you've, you've gone through the training. And then it's next steps is really up to your individual colleges. I don't know if, if our College of Public Health Ambassadors would reach out to you in, in the near future and maybe convene you just as ambassadors to maybe have, you know, some dialogue and discussion maybe answer some additional questions, Cody and, and Miguel. Yeah, I'd be, ha I'd be happy to, to answer any further questions as well. Um, I'm gonna link my email in the, in the chat box just in case. Um, so it should be saved in there. And then Chris, you might, as well. yeah. And then Chris, you might wanna put your email up there for your counterparts at the colleges and they can contact you since you oversee the uh, program at the College of Public Health. But we want to thank everybody for participating. We had a total of, uh, it was greater than 87 the last time I checked, but some have, some have um, signed off. Very much appreciate your, your attention and interest and let's, let's work together and make sure that we keep our campus and our other campuses as safe as possible because we do have other campuses around the state. So thanks everybody. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you.